in my humble opinion, the single most important biochemical reaction, especially to us, is cellular, cellular respiration. And the reason why I feel so strongly about that is because this is how we derive energy from what we eat, or from our fuel, or if we want to be specific, from glucose. At the end of the day, most of what we eat, or at least carbohydrates, end up as glucose. In the future videos, I'll talk about how we derive energy from fats or proteins. But cellular respiration, let's, let's go from glucose, from glucose to energy, and some other byproducts. And to be a little bit more specific about it, let me write the chemical reaction right here. So the, so the chemical formula for glucose, you're going to have six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens. So that's your glucose right there. So if you had one mole of glucose, let me write that. That's your glucose right there. And then to that one mole of glucose, if you had six moles of molecular oxygen running around the cell, then, and this is kind of a gross simplification for cellular rep respiration, I think you're going to appreciate over the course of the next few videos that one can get as involved into this, into this mechanism as possible. I think it's nice to get the big picture. But if you give me some glucose, if you have one mole of glucose and six moles of oxygen, through the process of cellular respiration, and so I'm just writing it as kind of a big black box right now. Let me pick a nice color. So this is cellular cellular respiration, which we'll see is quite involved, but I guess anything can be if you want to be particular enough about it. Through cellular respiration, we're going to produce six moles of carbon dioxide, six moles of water, and, and this is the key, this is the, the super important part, and we're going to produce energy. We're going to produce energy, and this is the energy that we're going to that that can be used to do uh, useful work, to, uh, to to heat our bodies, to and to provide electrical impulses in our brains. Whatever whatever energy, uh, uh, especially a human body needs, but it's not just humans. It's provided by this cellular respiration uh, mechanism. And when you say m energy, you might say, Hey, Sal, you know, in the last video, didn't you just well, if you if that was the last video you watched, you probably saw that I said that ATP. ATP is the energy currency, is the energy currency for biological systems. And so you might say, hey, well, it looks like glucose is the energy currency for biological systems. And to some degree, both, both answers would be correct. But to just see how it kind of fits together is that the process of cellular respiration, it does produce energy directly, but that energy is used to produce ATP. So if I were to break down this energy portion of cellular respiration right there, some of it would just be heat, you know, it just warms up the cell, and then some of it is used, and this is what the textbooks will tell you, the textbooks will say it produces 38 ATPs that can be more readily used by cells to contract muscles or generate nerve impulses or do whatever else or grow or divide or whatever else the cell might need. So really cellular respiration, to say it produces energy, a little disingenuous. It's really the process of taking glucose and producing ATPs with maybe heat as a byproduct, but it's probably nice to have that heat around. We need we need we need to be reasonably warm in order for our cells to operate correctly. So the whole point is really to go from glucose, from one mole of glucose, and the textbooks will tell you, to thirty eight ATPs. And the reality is this is in kind of the ideal circumstances that you'll produce 38 ATPs. I was reading up about it a little bit before doing this video. And the, the reality is, depending on the efficiency of the cell in performing cellular respiration, it'll probably be more on the order of 29 to 30 ATPs. But there's a huge variation here. And people are, are really still studying this idea. But this is all cellular respiration is. In the next few videos, we're going to break it down into its kind of constituent parts. And I'm going to introduce them to you right now, just so you kind of realize that these are parts of cellular respiration. The first stage is called glycolysis. Glycolysis, which literally means breaking up glucose and just so you know this this part you know this the gly for glucose and or the glyco for glucose really 
the glyco for glucose. And then lysis means to break up. When you saw hydrolysis, it means using water to break up a molecule. Glycolysis is means we're going to be breaking up glucose. And in case you care about things like word origins, glucose comes from the gluc, the, the gluc part of glucose comes from for Greek for sweet. And glucose is indeed sweet. And then all sugars, we put this os ending. So that just means sugar. So you might think it's kind of a redundant statement to say sweet sugar, but there are some sugars that aren't sweet. For example, lactose. So, you know, milk, it might be a little bit, but you know, when you actually when you actually digest lactose, then you can turn it into a, an actual sweet sugar, but it doesn't taste sweet like glucose or fructose would act or sucrose would taste. But anyway, that's a that's a an aside. But the first step of cellular respiration is glycolysis, breaking up of glucose. And what it does is it breaks up the glucose from a six carbon from a six carbon molecule. So it literally takes it from a six carbon molecule. Let me draw it like this. A six carbon molecule that is looks like this. And it's actually a cycle. Let me show you what glucose actually looks like. This is glucose right here. And notice you have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. I got this off of Wikipedia. Just look up glucose and you can see this diagram if you want to kind of see the details where you know, you can see I have six carbons, six oxygens. That's one, two, three, four, five, six. And then all of these little small blue things are my hydrogen. So that's what glucose actually looks like. But the process of glycolysis, you're essentially just taking the, I'm writing it out as a kind of a string, but you could imagine it as a chain. And it has oxygens and hydrogens added to it, to each of these carbons. But the, it has a carbon backbone, and it breaks that carbon backbone in two into two. That's what glycolysis does right there. So you kind of lysed the glucose and each of these things. And I haven't drawn all the other stuff that's added onto that. You know, These things are all bonded with other things, with oxygens and hydrogens and whatever. But each of these three carbon backbone molecules are called pyruvate. We'll go into a lot more detail on that. But by glycolysis, it generates, it by itself generates, well, it needs two ATPs, so it needs two ATPs, and it generates it generates four ATPs. So net net, on a net basis, it generates two, let me write this in a different color, it generates two net, two net ATP. So that's the first stage. And this ex this can occur completely in the absence of oxygen. I'll do a whole video on glycolysis in the future. Then these byproducts, they get re-engineered a little bit, and then they enter into what's called the Krebs cycle. They enter what's called the Krebs, Krebs cycle, which generates another two ATP. And then, and this is the this is kind of the interesting point. There's another process that you can kind of say happens after the Krebs cycle, but we're in a cell and everything is bumping into everything all of the time. But it's normally kind of viewed to be after glycolysis in the Krebs cycle. And this requires let me make it, this requires oxygen. Requires oxygen. So let me be clear. Glycolysis, this first step, no oxygen required, or doesn't need oxygen. Oxygen, it can occur with oxygen or without it. Oxygen not needed. Oxygen not needed. Or you could say this is called an anaerobic process. This is, you know, this is the anaerobic part of the respiration. Let me write that down too. Anaerobic. Maybe I'll write it down here. Glycolysis. Glycolysis. Since it doesn't need oxygen, we can say it's anaerobic. You might be familiar with the idea of aerobic exercise. The whole idea of aerobic exercise is to make you breathe hard because you need a lot of oxygen to do aerobic exercises. So anaerobic means you don't need oxygen. Aerobic means it needs oxygen. Anaerobic means the opposite. You don't need oxygen. So glycolysis, anaerobic, and it produces two ATPs net. And then you go to the Krebs cycle. Then you go to the Krebs cycle. There's a little bit of setup involved here, and we'll do the detail of that in the future. But then you move over to the Krebs cycle, which is aerobic. It is aerobic. It requires oxygen to be around. And then this produces two 
ATPs. And then this is the part that, frankly, when I first learned it confused me a lot, but I'll just write it in order the way it's traditionally wrote. Then you have something called, we're using the same colors too much, you have something called the electron transport chain. Electron transport chain. And this part gets credit for producing the bulk of the ATPs, 34 ATPs. And this is also aerobic. It requires oxygen. So you can see, if you had no oxygen, if, you weren't, if the cells weren't getting enough oxygen, you can produce a little bit of energy. But if, if you don't, but it's nowhere near as much as you can produce once you have the oxygen. And actually, when you when you start running out of oxygen, you know this can't proceed forward. So what happens is some of these byproducts of glycolysis, instead of going into the Krebs cycle in the electron transport chain where they need oxygen, instead they go through a side process called fermentation. Fermentation. For some organisms, this process of fermentation takes your byproducts of glycolysis and literally produces alcohol. That's where alcohol comes from. That's called alcohol fermentation. And we, as human beings, I guess fortunately or unfortunately, our muscles do not directly produce alcohol. They produce lactic acid. So we, pr we, we do lactic acid fermentation. Let me write that down. Lactic acid. That's humans and probably other mammals. Humans. But other things like yeast will do, so yeast will do alcohol form fermentation. Alcohol, alcohol fermentation. So this is when you don't have oxygen. It's actually this lactic acid that if I were to you know, sprint really hard and not be able to get enough oxygen, that my muscles start to ache because this lactic acid starts to build up. But that's just a side thing. If we have oxygen, we can move to the Krebs cycle, get our two ATPs, and then go on to the electron transport chain and produce 34 ATPs, which is really the bulk of what happens in respiration. Now, I kind of said this as an aside that, you know, to some degree this isn't fair because while these guys are operating, they're also producing these other molecules or let me, they're not producing them entirely, but what they're doing is they're taking and I know it gets complicated here, but I think over the course of the next few videos we'll get an intuition for it. In these two parts of the reaction, glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, we're constantly taking NAD, all right, is NAD plus, and we're adding hydrogens to it to form NADH. And this actually happens for ten for one molecule of glucose, this happens to ten NADs, or ten NAD pluses to become NADHs. And those are actually what drive the electron transport chain. And I'll talk a lot more about it and kind of how that happens and why is energy being uh, derived and, and how is this an oxidative reaction and all of that and you know what's getting oxidized and what's being reduced. But I just wanted to give due credit. These guys aren't just producing two ATPs in each, each of these stages. They're also producing, actually combined, 10 NADHs, which are then used, which each which each produce three ATPs in an ideal situation, the electron transport chain. And they're also doing it to this other molecule, FAD, which is very similar, but they're producing FA, FADH. Now, I know that all of this is very complicated. I'll make videos on this in the future. But the important thing to remember is cellular respiration, all it is is taking glucose and kind of repackaging the energy in glucose and repackaging it in the form of, your textbooks will tell you, 38 ATPs. And if you're taking an exam, that's a good number to write. It tends to, in reality, be a smaller number. And it's also going to produce heat. Actually, most of it is going to be heat. But 38 ATPs, and it does it through three stages. The first stage is glycolysis, where you're just literally splitting splitting the glucose into two, you're generating some ATPs. But the more important thing is you're generating some NADHs that are going to be used later in the electron transport chain. Then those byproducts are split even more in the Krebs cycle, directly producing two ATPs. But that produces a lot more NADHs. And then all of those NADHs are used in the electron transport chain to produce the bulk of your, of your energy currency, or your 34 ATPs.